Hello, my name is Luke and welcome to Scapegoat, the podcast where we decide who gets the blame and who gets away with murder. This week we're going to be looking into the story of Reuben Carter, a boxer jailed for 20 years. This week we've got a very special guest. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself? This is my friend Van. Yeah, hi guys, this is Van Powell. Hi, wow, Van Powell, but uh, yeah, cool. <laughs> so we're going to be looking this week into the case of Reuben Carter. So before we start that, Van, are you much of a boxing fan? Uh, not really. I mean, I like the sport, but I couldn't say my I'm a fan. So I can't get you to speculate on tonight's McGregor Mayweather match. I actually saw a picture of them last night when I was doing a little bit of reading for this. And, uh, you know, I think Mayweather looks a little scarier. I think so, too. I, I wouldn't like to meet either of them. Like, supposedly, <laughs> like Ruben Carter, they're only about five foot eight. And just so you know, I'm about six foot and Vaughn's six three. But uh, still, they'd scare me quite a bit. <laughs> sure. I think maybe all the muscles on muscles is probably what I'm most afraid of. Yeah. Okay. And uh, had you heard of Ruben Carter before we went into this story? Yes, of course. Um, you know, I was kind of first introduced to him and kind of like the story we're going to be talking about here through like first listening to Bob Dylan's song, The Hurricane, then later on through pop culture watching the, the movie. Okay, yeah. Like you've seen the Denzel Washington film because it's quite different actually I learned. Oh, sh- I, was, I was going that, but we're going to look into the life of Reuben Carter. So Reuben Carter was born in May 6th, 1937 in uh, New Jersey. So He was a quiet child who stuttered until the age of 18. When he was being bullied, he tended to just punch the other children. He said, what he said as a quote, when the other children tease me, the next thing they would hear is my fist flying through the air. Do you think growing up as a black man in 1930s, 40s, 50s America would have been an easy way? Uh, Probably not. I imagine, you know, as it says from his quotes and everything like that, he was getting into many scuffles and fights. Um, Probably not really paving the way for a, you know, quiet peaceful life so it's really no wonder he turned to violence and then later on for his career uh violence in the form of boxing okay i don't know the american states that well but would new jersey be i would have always imagined racism was more prevalent in the south but would it be as bad so, so yeah i mean racism definitely as uh institution is more prevalent in the south for sure but that's like You know, I mean, generally feelings towards race were definitely uh, tenuous and still, you know, you had a lot of prejudice, even in the northern states as well, as you still do today. But mostly for the most part, it was really the the really fervent, more malicious feelings towards race were definitely in the south. Okay, but he got into a lot of trouble at the age of 11. He stabbed a man in the hand and got sent away to a reform school. He was released at the age of 14, but... He went back in for assault, so he wasn't the most uh, pacifistic character, was he? Exactly. I mean, this is exactly kind of what I was talking about. Like, he's already building a case for himself that's not really looking good in terms of his character. He joined the U.S. Army at the age of, I think it was 17. When in the Army, he he started challenging people to boxing matches. He got into a boxing match with the number one fighter in the U.S. Army, and he didn't even have the shoes, the gloves, anything. He basically got lance stuff, and he won the fight in the first round. Yeah, I mean, this is pretty ridiculous. Kind of a newbie to fighting in terms of, um, you know, scoring and the sport just kind of really speaks to his, I don't know, maybe raw talent, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I feel that if you're playing a game against someone who doesn't know the rules exactly, they can be the hardest person, because, like... I remember playing video games with my brother and he wouldn't know the controls, but he would somehow kick my ass by mashing and doing insane stuff that I would have never seen. Right, well, I think, you know, in this case, Carver was mashing a lot more things. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but unlike the movie, uh, when the movie portrayed him as a bit of a war hero, but he got stationed in West Germany and in about six months, he got kicked out for four court martials of for various behavior, different discipline offenses. So he's not a man who really likes authority. Right. Here we go again. I mean, this is just kind of like story after story with him. By this time, you know, he's what, in his like early 20s, maybe like late teens, already had many altercations, Russians with the law and everything like that. It's not looking good for him. Okay. And then later that year, when he back, went back to New Jersey, he was convicted of two muggings and imprisoned in 1961. In his autobiography, he completely admits to doing it, so it's not like he was set up for these particular crimes. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, 
and I think as we're going to go into later, like there's definitely a, a difference between like, what some would consider like petty crime and then also a capital a crime like murder. But, you know, we'll save that for later. When he got out of prison in 1961, he went into sports, he went into boxing. And uh, like in the army, he just seemed to have like a raw talent. Due to an aggressive style, he would just not often knock out his opponents in the first round. And that's where he got the nickname Hurricane because people said he would just be like, a hurricane with blows and stuff just constantly hitting and jabbing and just pretty much you'd be in a pulp in like 30 seconds <laughs> yeah ex exactly i think um the hurricane's a pretty scary uh nickname in for terms of fighting and boxing uh, I, I definitely wouldn't want to be in the match with them if you had a nickname for like a boxing what, what would you go by i think i'd be <laughs> luke the yellow dart oh geez uh, maybe van the man powell just because it rhymes I think that would be a good if you ever went into WWE. It's like the man. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, that'd be a pretty good gimmick. But yeah. <laughs> so he quickly rose up and he was rated between like the 10th and the 6th best middleweight. You know, it was constantly in flux. But Ring Magazine was saying, you know, this is an up and comer for the middleweight. You know, this guy's going to be a real contender. But he went against someone called Emil Griffith, who would have been the next champion. People, he actually was a future champion later in life but he was seen as like the best at the time like the best up and comer he got a shock victory and knocked out a meal yeah exactly i mean this is kind of like maybe his high point i think during his career uh as we see later on uh he quite he begins losing matches doesn't really look good for what, like his career in it and i think that kind of can be used as an attribute to as a something that can be attributed to his like crime some people try to make the argument yeah but he did have a title chance against joey giardello a man i'd never heard of but he's supposedly really famous this was for the middleweight title carter started the fight well and he started like you know first four rounds he was knocking giardello pretty hard but then he went for like a finishing punch and giardello just didn't even flinch people say like i've read commentators say like he seemed to lose confidence and then he just kept losing rounds and losing rounds and I've heard different people say from that point on, he just wasn't the same boxer. Yeah, right. So, I mean, he, essentially, he lost this fight by unanimous decision. Um, people thought the judging was biased. But, I mean, yeah, after this point, like, he continues to lose his matches and kind of falls off the face of the boxing world here, ending with his final results as 27 wins, 12 losses, and one draw. I mean, that's not really the most um, decorated career, I would say. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people that, you know, they get up to and then the second that they lose one, they just can't stop losing. And that's kind of what happened. He won some of them, but, you know, it didn't do his career any good. But in the movie, Joey Giardello, it said it appears like the fight is very rigged and the judging is rigged. But most people at the time saying, you know, no, it was actually a fair decision. And Joey Giardello actually sued the film because it made him look like, you know, a racist dick and he's like that's not me i know you want denzel to look good but i'm not that's not me man i mean i don't know anyone next to denzel is probably not gonna look that great honestly uh i do look denzel a lot he's a i think he's a great actor and uh you know too bad for giardello well i mean it's hard to go up against denzel yeah sure exactly so you know he was a he was a major part of his local community and you know of patterson new jersey and you know he's a well-known figure around and, you know, very, he was kind of seen as like a pillar of the black community. Even though he had been in jail, you know, he's just like a very upstanding guy that a lot of people liked. But he did have a mean streak. Sure. I mean, like, I think this is kind of when people are talking about he's kind of like a role model, takes children under his wing. Um, as we'll find out later, he's with a kind of, when the time of the murders happened, he's with a, um, a one of the suspects, artist, Mr. Artist, is a, uh, you know, basically a really up and coming kid from high school, like, you know, kind of just taking him under the wing. So yeah, very, very liked in the black community in Patterson, for sure. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't like heavily investing with a lot of money, but he was giving an awful lot of time to people. And, you know, people would have known if you've got a problem, you might go to Hurricane. Sure, that's it. That's kind of making it sound a bit like a mob figure, though, isn't oh, it? Oh, no, no, no. no not, I'm not trying to make him sound... Oh, man, that's just a bad way of words with me, man. <laughs> no, of course. And of course he wasn't. But, um, 
you know, I mean, definitely, he was definitely someone that was looked up to in the community for sure, which I think will definitely, you know, later on come back to help him in some of his legal proceedings. Yeah, okay, so let's move on to the Lafayette bar murders. So this is the main crux of uh, when things started to go wrong for Carter. Oh, the murders, that's when it went wrong? You would have said it went wrong earlier? Oh, no, I'm just joking with you. Oh, okay. No, I was thinking, like, you know, like, you're like, no, he went to prison once and he's off my list. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. So I'm okay with prisoners, that's fine. Okay, good to know. Okay, just in case uh, we've got a couple of listeners who are in jail. I don't know that as a fact, but uh, just in case. Hi, guys. But, uh, yeah, so earlier in the day, a personal friend of uh, Hurricane Carter's, who was a black man who was murdered by a white person. This happened not because of racism, but it was over a dispute to do with money. So you'd say, like, the around that time... Things seem very racially charged, if you get my drift, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, it was a, you know, it was like a dispute over money, and then after this part, like a lot of people, there's this idea that what eventually led to the Lafayette um, Grill bar murders was revenge murder. A lot right. of people were saying, "Let's go, let's get these, let's get these guys who murdered our friend, and we'll see how that develops." Because Carter was out with artists that night, and uh, he was looking for shotguns. He was looking for actually guns that he had lent to somebody about a year ago, and he actually hadn't got his hands on. Right, exactly. And so I think he was looking for shotguns. And uh, do you remember? Was he looking also for the uh, the thirty two as well? Yeah, Pistol? yeah, yeah. Right. But so I don't really good. think that that's strong evidence because you know if I was if I kind of felt that there was like tension within like the community and my guns were out there it might be like a smart move to try and get them back because you know you could end up getting fingered for a crime you know if one of your guns ended up being a murder weapon sure right yeah just kind of taking stock so you're yeah i mean he's such a like person in the community maybe he was like um you know loaning his guns to people just for fun i don't but, know i mean uh, are you a gun owner no i'm not Okay, but if you were, would you lend your gun to someone? Of course not, no. Of course <laughs> I would not. <laughs> that seems, uh, it just seems like a bit of a risky move. On, okay, so later that evening, about 2 a.m., the Lafayette Bar, which is like a whites-only establishment, two black men entered the Lafayette Bar and Grill, which was on 18th Street, and began shooting. The bartender right. was instantly killed, and some other patrons were killed. The ending, it ended up with three people dead, but... Some people died later of their injuries. Right, exactly. So maybe we should. So the two, the people who were were killed was uh, the bartender was immediately killed. Um, a female customer who with the, who sustained injuries died a month later, and then we'll find out later that um, Willie Marins survives the attack but loses sight in one eye, which is pretty important to note in considering um, positive identifications. Okay, yes. But the female customer who died of injuries later, she was actually enough, she was comp compass mentis enough at the time to make statements to the police. So uh, that was, so she was one of the people whose evidence were used later in the case against uh, Carter. Right, exactly. A major character in the story appears now, a man called Alfred Bello. And this man's like a petty criminal who's got like a lot of runs in the law for like petty theft and trying to steal something. And he said that he was in the area trying to rob a factory and he saw two men uh, run out of the bar and get into a white dodge and drive off. So I'm sorry, this is just this is just so ridiculous to me right now. Like this is like some where the I think the case kinda loses some of its credence. It's like Oh yeah, I was in the neighborhood, robbing, robbing the bank. It was these guys. They they came in, they killed them. I was just like, oh, I, you know, I was just minding my business, robbing the factory. <laughs> you know, that's that's just one of those bits that, like, you know, you couldn't. I I kind of I couldn't find out why he made the statement. Like, you know, if the police had added that to it, but if I if I witnessed something like that, I would say I'm walking a dog or something. You know. <laughs> Or I was trying to bring something to my friend, or I was out having sure. a drink. You know, just anything. Like, uh, yeah, anything like less inno less innocuous or you know more innocent than robbing a factory. I mean, you could have just been I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Walking your dog. It's just it's completely absurd. Why did? Maybe he was scared. I don't know. But still, at the time, like I just it's pretty absurd. 
Well, I mean, my, unless it's one of those, like, 50s jive terms that, like, I'm just not aware of. Hey, I was robbing a factory, which really means, like, you know, walking down the promenade for your main girl. Sure. Or something a little less uh, innocent. With... Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. It was, it, was, it, was, it was the 60s. Sexual innuendo was everywhere. I'm not sure, but... Oh, uh, those, I've seen too many 60s movies. It's like, hey, hey, this movie's got red hot kisses and... Uh, you know, white, white hot hugs, and you're like, so this is a dirty movie. Oh no, 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 no! It's just he kisses her on the cheek at the very end, and I'm like, oh god, why am I watching this? Exactly, exactly. But what's interesting though here is that so even though he was a criminal robbing a factory, uh, his kind of identification of two black men getting into a white Dodge and driving away was supported by uh, a neighbor in the area, Ronald Ruggiero, and also P- Patricia Graham. Uh, they also said they saw two witnesses escape. But a lot of their evidence was they couldn't all exactly agree on the type of car because they really focused on Bellow saying it was a Dodge. But Patricia, when she was saying stuff, it wasn't the exact same story that uh, Bellow was sharing. Right. And so also from going on from here, we should note that Patricia, I think at the time's name was Graham, but later changed to Valentine. So I think... You guys would know that from possibly the song The Hurricane, Patty Valentine and Bello both thought they said. Um, so just from now on, I guess we'll just say Patty Valentine. But yeah, this is something pretty important. Patricia Valentine or Patty Valentine goes into describing um, the back lights, the tail lights of this Dodge, white Dodge car. And so she describes them as butterfly like and that they are completely full of light but only around like not in the middle but on the outline of the of the uh, triangular butterfly shape which comes into a lot of scrutiny because later on um she redacts the statement and says that she changes it to look like another similar kind of dodge model because we don't have pictures for you to look at this but at the time hurricane carter's driving a white dodge polara which is very similar in its taillights with the Dodge Monaco. So it's very kind of sketchy and up in the air whether or not she actually positively identified his or a Monaco's um, back taillights. The other thing about it was that they said the car had out-of-state plates, and I'm a bit confused because, you know, I've never been to America. Would the different states have different license plates? or Right, so yes, of course. Um, and it would be very distinct as well. And this is actually a great point and one that kind of makes me think to the contrary against Carter's case. It's maybe the thing I have the most difficulty uh, swallowing in believing Carter's innocence. So Patty Valentine says she sees a blue plate with gold lettering. And uh, I mean, right now in the 1960s, like things... Like, that's so much different from how the plates are these days, so I couldn't tell you what um, state that probably was. But that she was able to identify Carter's plates, actually, and going back to Carter's plate himself and looking at it, it's black, uh, blue background and gold lettering, that's pretty incriminating. Because what are the chances that you're going to be driving a very similar enough car, but have the same out-of-state license plate type? Okay. Yeah, very true, very true. But we'll move on to what Carter was doing that night. So Carter was out with the man, a van named... <laughs> well, the man, that's too good of a wrestling name. But uh, uh, he was out with John Artis. And John Artis, again, was just an 18-year-old student. And he had a scholarship to Colorado State. And he was just like an up-and-coming like member of the black community. Basically, uh, Carter was out looking for his guns, but he was also drinking quite heavily, and you know he couldn't drive his car. He couldn't drive his own car, so he's like, "Here, kid, would you drive my car?" And the kid was like, "Shut up, Mister! I'll drive your car." I know that's not what John Artis sounds like, but I imagine everyone in the early '60s speaking that way. Right, it's just very wholesome. Sure, like this is like just getting early '60s. So this is '66, but still, you know, just post-war kind of like. Bright-eyed, bushy-tailed. Let's help people out. Yeah. But but here here's the one thing. Um, this is crazy. He's out drinking, looking for his guns. This sounds this <laughs> it's just like just as an aside. Um, man, how crazy is that, right? But, you know, I need to find these guns, but I need to make sure I'm pretty plied with with alcohol to do it. 
<laughs> but it does sound like, you know, it sounds like, you know, the concept for a Rick Ross song or something, you know. <laughs> right. Sure. I mean, or, or like, yeah, or many other rap songs, you know, or like, let's, yeah, for sure. Yeah, man. That's... Basically, that they're driving back from the club and they've got a third man who... Uh, He's like, can you also drop me home? And again, artist is like, sure, mister. And uh, he drops the third man home. But on the way there, they get stopped by the police. And the police say, hey, we're looking for two black men in a do- white Dodge. Or Actually, I don't think they knew about the Dodge at that stage. Not it- at this point, no, they did not. Okay, so you say- they haven't. Sorry, because they ha- they don't know about the white dodge yet because they haven't been to the crime scene to get the eyewitness statements. Okay, okay, that that's clear. Okay, but they were looking for two black men because they had heard that over the radio. But they saw three black men in a car, so they were like, okay, well, you know, we're looking for two, so yeah, you guys are free to go. Artists drove the third man home and he dropped them home. And the story changes a little bit here. I wasn't sure because according to some sources... The police got the radio and then chased the artist down the road and found him. Well, other people, well, artist himself says that he was driving back through the same way that the police were to drop uh, Carter home. Yeah, and so I, I actually didn't find anything about this chase that you're talking about. My, what I was, what I found was just that he was driving back to the same place. Okay, well, I've read a version that the police said that they realized so they actually drove after him about they got a message 10 minutes later so they chased up the road to find him but you know that's artist himself says he just drove for the same checkpoint i don't know about you but if i saw a police checkpoint i kind of would probably go like one street two streets left or right just not to deal with it or be stopped again yeah and i i mean i mean definitely i can't so I can't put myself in the mind of a black man in the mid '60s, but I would also imagine that maybe you would want to stay away from something like that as well. Also, just being myself and living in America these days, like I want to avoid the cops at all costs for sure. I mean, I, the cops here don't have guns, or they do in Northern Ireland, not in the South. But you know, even if it was just like a local Garda and he was just stopping cars to say there's a parade on or something, I. I just wouldn't, I would just deliberately avoid going that way because, like, you never know. You could just say the wrong thing and you could end up with a criminal record. Well, so, right, this is Ireland, right? So you could end up with a criminal record. You say the wrong thing in the United States, you could end up dead. Yeah, I mean, that's it, pretty hardcore. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so when they drive for the checkpoint again, they say, okay, no, you're two black men in a white Dodge. We're taking you to the crime scene. Both Artis and Carter are detained and brought to the crime scene. They're lined up against the wall when the dead bodies are being taken out of the tavern. And uh, Artis, as you imagine, says it's very traumatizing. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, he's a young guy just going to college, sees these dead bodies. Like, I'm sure that's very traumatizing for anyone. Yeah. So they take out the, they take out, they're taking out the bodies and they ask the witnesses, are these the men who shot them? And... The witnesses pretty unilaterally said, no, no, they're not. Right. And so this is pretty strong evidence here because like it's the most, the least amount of time after the crime occurred, the witnesses who are there are right in front of suspected perpetrators and they say what seems without a doubt, no, it's not. So it's pretty wild at this point that it continues to stick. They find guns in Carter's trunk because that's what he said that he had been doing that night. Yeah. They find these guns in the trunk and surprisingly they take them into evidence but they don't bring them to the evidence locker until five days after the crime they're just lying in a cop's back seat exactly and so this is this is uh, the 32 pistol and 12 gauge shotgun that they take this is very similar to actually something that happened in the oj simpson case where one of the police officers investigating took evidence home to his house in simi valley and after a weekend so right so Think about all the kind of contamination that can affect crime scene investigations. It's just it's just bad policing. Yeah, I mean, the police at the same time, they didn't look for blood samples or fingerprints or anything in the bar. They didn't do any forensic work. And I don't know police procedures in the 1960s, but you think they would. But it is... Yeah, ex- ex- sorry, exactly. I mean, you think they would do that. It just seems like there's something kind of maybe 
guiding them besides just like getting the job done. This it smells a little bit there, doesn't it? Yes. And the artist and Carter have like no blood or no signs of any scuffle on them. They're pretty much just dressed like they're back from the club. So exactly. And so that's actually part of the reason why they were able to get to the police checkpoint the first time is because the cops noticed that there was no blood or anything like that on them. Although what didn't happen was they didn't do a test for like gunpowder residue on their clothes, which would have been very, you know, telling if there was, if they were a part of any kind of shooting or anything like that. Unfortunately, that didn't take place. Okay, so you can kind of see the police work isn't the best here. But uh, both Carter and Artis, the second that they're told, hey, these guys aren't, they're released. But so they thought it was just like a traumatizing evening. And they summoned a grand jury. And both Carter and uh, Artis just voluntarily testified before it to say, hey, this is what happened to us. And the jury returned no indictment. Right. Um, but yes, no indictment. I think it's also important to note before we go on, the, the guns that they found in the car, the thirty two caliber pistol and the 12 gauge shotgun, did match the caliber of the casings found at the crime scene. Okay. I had read that... Uh, it was a different that it was the same caliber of casings but it was a different i don't know that much about bullets but one was like one bullets were made of copper but the ones i found in the car were made of nickel i think so they were different right or right or brass yeah this is definitely something that i read as well so definitely the same caliber but not the casings aren't of the same material and i guess like that's it seems like a circumstantial evidence and it seems because you could have possibly different munitions yeah. of different casings that's possible i mean why not but usually when you buy ammunition it's going to all be this in the same casing so not necessarily pointing towards innocence but also not pointing towards guilty as well just what's more crazy is that the, the rounds were of the same exact calibers i've got a bit of i've just come up with this in my head now but what if the bullets that were in the gun initially were the other man who had lent them bullets, but then, <laughs> you know, then, you know, he just used what was in the gun, you know, the part, he could have used what's in the gun and uh, then he just had his own. But again, that's a crank theory coming from absolutely nowhere. <laughs> sure, sure. So I guess let's continue with the, um, the, grand, the grand jury. Sure. So the grand jury pretty much say nothing, these men aren't, these men didn't do it, but what is a grand jury again? I'm sorry, I don't know exactly. Oh my gosh. Um, and I only say oh my gosh because, you know, I should know that myself. But I think a grand jury is more or less like a professional jury, like one that's summoned to rule on a case so that it will either go to trial or not go to trial. And that could be incorrect knowledge or incorrect facts that I'm giving you. We'll check that. It probably changes state by state, I'd imagine. That, uh, there's That's different... also true. That's also very possible as well. Okay. At this point, Carter and Artis just think, bad night, but nothing, nothing really terrible has happened of this. You know, we just got, we're just being cased by the police again. But, you know... Hey, we're away and we can do what we want. Several months later, Bello, the factory robber, disclosed to the police that he had an accomplice during his attempt at a burglary, someone called Arthur Dexter Bradley. Bradley said that uh, when they saw this, they saw the two men carrying weapons outside the bar. They said they both recognized them as 100% being Carter and Artis. You know, no, these are the people that we saw. They told us to the police, and Carter and Artis were immediately arrested. Right, arrested and indicted on the charges, which were bringing them up to trial. So this is pretty ridiculous. Um, you know, Bella, the factory uh, robber, is like, oh, by the way, yeah, um, I was robbing that factory, but my friend was also with me robbing it. And, you know, I told you, like, uh, I wasn't sure who it was, but it was definitely Carter and Artis. <laughs> yeah. So this is absurd and pretty ridiculous and smells to high hell. Okay, I mean, there's two viewpoints on this. The first is that uh, they, he was saying that Carter is a major member of the community and he was scared about speaking out about him because, you know, something bad would happen to him. And the other one is a man called Vincent D. Simone, who was the crime team investigator, offered him $12,000 as a reward to testify against Carter. Uh, the deal would also include 
basically the factory robbing charges being dismissed and previous charges being dismissed. Which of these two do you think is more likely? Uh, well, uh, the one that has more deep, the one I think the one that's like simpler to understand is more likely. Usually, that's the case. I and then for me, that's uh, the second viewpoint that the chief investigator bribed Bello. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it was it was it wasn't technically a bribe, but it was just leaving money on a table and saying, "Oh, I don't know what happened." Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the so artist and Carter go to trial. And they're represented by a famous civil rights lawyer, Raymond A. Brown. Brown was like a well-known person. You know, he'd be a bit like Johnny Cochran back in the day, but I don't think Johnny Cochran did much civil rights, did he? Johnny Cochran definitely did not. He actually wanted to distance himself from that. So it's probably, yeah, I mean, not Johnny Cochran. I, I was trying to make a kind of connection to myself in my mind here. I'm not sure of a good person to kind of cast him as, but not a Johnny Cochran. Johnny Cochran wanted to separate himself as race uh, in his professional life as much as possible. Okay. No, I just watched that, uh, you know, the David Schwimmer, uh, O.J. Simpson thing. So that's why it's stuck in my head. Right. But this is like a very good kind of like lawyer to have. And, you know, it's a good man to have your back. And Carter and Artis's defense was basically, look, this evidence is really inconsistent. And the eyewitnesses are saying different things. We've got alibis at the night spot, you know, the bar that we're at, which is which is only four blocks away from the shooting. But these people say at the time of the shootings that they were still at the night spot. Right. So four blocks away. I was doing the math yesterday. It's about a fourth of a mile. You know, definitely easy to get there real quick. But still, they have alibis. Okay, so just for time purposes, the police stopped Carter about 10 minutes after the shootings. He would have left the bar within a couple of minutes of uh, the shooting happening, according to Carter. That's a little bit... I know 2.30 is about closing time, but yeah, that's that just rings a little bit odd to me. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, I agree as well. The prosecution relied on the testimony of Bellow and Bradley, the men who had ID'd Carter, and they didn't actually pre-announce these people as witnesses. So the defense didn't know who they really were and didn't have time to pretty much learn that they were factory robbers and general scumbags that, and tell the jury that because it would have affected the jury's belief that it actually happened if they knew how corrupt Bellow and uh, Bradley really were. Right, and I'm, I'm really kind of surprised that in, in trial orderings that this wasn't thrown out. Yeah, but... You know, it's one of those things that I would have thought it would have been unconstitutional, but hey. Well, usually I think that the the defense and prosecution have to announce who their witnesses are going to be to the other side, but I don't know. Okay, but shock witnesses, Lionel Hutt style lawyering, but uh, yeah. So they had an all right white jury. So what do you think happened? Big surprise there. So, right, it's just stacked, right? For the most part, I think that. Definitely playing on the race here. Here are two black men. One's uh, been in trouble with the law throughout his life. Um, dangerous man. Dangerous to society. Lock him up, right? And so who's going to agree with that? A bunch of white people. But uh, they basically found both men guilty. But in New Jersey law at the time, the jury would decide the sentence of the convicted person. So the prosecution were pushing very heavily for the death penalty. But the jury gave life sentences. Yeah, right. So this is kind of like people have said that maybe they gave him a um, life sentence because they didn't actually believe that he was responsible for it, but that he was found guilty because he was black. So kind of like a less severe, kind of going all the way, not shy of that. So yeah, they pretty much were like, we don't like you, so you're going to jail, but you probably didn't do the crime. So just your whole life. <laughs> yeah, artists got uh, two consecutive life sentences and one at the very end of that while Carter, being seen as the main ringleader, got three life sentences which would be stacked after each other. So one life sentence, one life sentence, one life sentence. And at the time, life meant life, really. So if you got a life sentence, you're going to prison. So it seems a bit uh, supercilious to uh, say, hey, you got three life sentences. Yeah, just kind of overkill. Yeah, but I suppose that's what people want to see in justice, air quotes. <laughs> Exactly. Carter was in prison once again, so it wasn't completely unfamiliar to him because he had spent about six years in a young offenders institution and he had spent about five years earlier in jail for muggings, but uh, 
Yeah, life must be a very scary thing to have. Right, so it doesn't seem like he really adapted well here. Um, kind of, you know, we already know he doesn't have a, a good relationship with authority. But during this time, like, Carter was able to um, begin uh, Im improving on his difficulties with reading and writing. And uh, at this time, also attempted to write his first book about his life experiences, which took about three to five years to publish. Yeah, like he said himself that uh, he wasn't illiterate, but his reading and writing was at a very low level. And he just slowly began to write like a very good book. It was uh, the book was titled uh, The 16th Round, going from number one contender to four five. Four, seven, two. So this book came out in 1974 and Carter says, I'm innocent. It's his big major statement. Right. And so apparently the book sold moderately well. Bob Dylan was the one who kind of read this and then reached out to Carter visiting him in prison. Uh, apparently uh, Dylan was there, had stayed and visited for nine hours, kind of talking to Carter about what had happened and developed this kind of bond. And so this is kind of like where Dylan finds the impetus to write the song Hurricane, which uh, is a, you know, a wonderful song. Okay, but the thing I've got, I wonder about Dylan's involvement with this because the one thing I found very odd was he did bring a photographer with him when he met Carter. Oh, okay, yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I mean, I guess for marketing purposes, it would make sense, you know, here's this guy who's, you know, a big time musician he's going to meet this guy he's gonna write a song about it kind of also to kind of publicize the wrongful imprisonment so i mean i don't think maybe i don't think he's an opportunist in this point or if it is it's more underplayed by maybe like the kind of protest singing that dylan was kind of known for yeah well the men got on very well and the thing about it was carter didn't know dylan was going to uh, do a song for him but it was just like hey, this famous guy wants to meet you. And then he was like, hey, I'm bored. I'll talk to this guy for nine <laughs> hours. And, you know, it was like, I like the cut of Dylan's jib. Or... So he kind of was like, hey, like, you know, I've been in prison for seven years and I've got a famous person who likes me. And hey. and then Dylan turns up the next week and says, here, I wrote a song. And he just starts playing the song and Hurricane's like, damn, I like this song. <laughs> damn, man, that song's tight. Yeah. That's what that's what he said, and Dylan was like, oh, "Try to do it, Dylan." But yeah, man, it's good. Uh, Bob Dylan, here's a song, Hurricane Carter. <laughs> oh, exactly. But yeah, Hurricane. Uh, do you like the song Hurricane? Oh yeah, it's a wonderful song. It's a it's a very nice. I like Dylan's storytelling. It's yeah, it's beautiful. It's a classic. Yeah, he actually. I read that he had to change some of the lyrics because. He was going very heavily into slander, saying, like, Bellow had robbed the bodies and all this sort of stuff in his original draft. Oh, brother. Yeah, okay. I can see maybe why he would have to change the lyrics from a law, a law legal point of view. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, he was just he was just like, I'm going to release this. And his lawyers were like, Bob, you can't, like, I understand it's a protest song, but you can't say these men stole from bodies. Like, you will get sued. But, uh, sure. Sure, so there's this Madison Avenue advertising guru, George uh, Lois, or Lewis. Uh, he begins a campaign here to try to get Carter retrialed and pardoned. And probably that's kind of coming off the tail end or the boot heels of this Dylan kind of, you know, awareness raising, which, at, you know, also Dylan at this time is arranging a benefit concert in uh, Carter's behalf and raises about $100,000, I guess, for um, Carter before the second trial actually gets underway. Yeah. Because Carter, although he had like a title shot, he wasn't an incredibly wealthy man. You know, he had money, but it wouldn't be like Floyd Mayweather money now. It wouldn't be hundreds of millions of dollars. The, the whole thing was he wasn't that rich of a man, so he did need help. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, how are you going to get out of jail? How are you going to raise these um, costs for court and everything like that, lawyer fees mm -hmm. and everything? Good thing Bob Dylan came along. Yeah. So coincidentally, at the same time, Bradley and Bellow, the factory robbers, recanted their identification of Carter and Artis. So they basically said, look, we were pressured into doing this by the police. And coincidentally, at this time, Vincent De Simone actually had retired from the police force. So they kind of said, no, 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 we actually were, we were kind of persuaded into doing this. 
Right, exactly. So here it comes out. This is pretty pretty ridiculous. I, I feel like a lot of the case rested on Bella and Bradley's uh, identification, and this probably like I don't I don't pretty ridiculous that it even continues from this point. Um, I guess like there was the question of the out of state license plates and the back tail lights, and also of the um, the guns and everything like that that we still need to clear up in the second trial. So from this point, it's pretty clear that there's going to be a second trial, but. The judge didn't want to use perjured testimony, so he had Bellow take a polygraph test. The test indicated that Bellow was telling the truth about seeing Carter after the shooting. However, many of the details had now changed. Bellow said he was in the bar at the time rather than outside, so, you know, Bellow's story is shifting even more. Right, exactly. I think it's also important to kind of tell the other side of the story as well, because I think a lot of people, um, some things that I've read have said that Carter's alibi changes a lot um, from where he was, jumping all over the place, but also in terms of polygraph lie detector tests. I think the prosecutors gave Reuben Carter the chance to take a polygraph test, and if he passed, they would drop all charges in the second trial, and Carter refused to do it. A lot of people kind of looking at this and pointing to it as a sign of his guilt or an inadvertent admittance to his guilt in it. And, but I, just, for me, I don't know. I did some research on lie detector tests, and they seem a little bit sketchy. Yeah, I mean, they're, I don't know about in North Carolina, but I can tell you in Ireland, they're inadmissible in court. They don't mean anything. That's exactly the same case it is now over here in the United States as well. What happened then was it was pretty clear that there was going to be a trial, and since there was a retrial, it meant Carter was actually allowed out of jail if he could pay a bail bond. Okay. So this happened in the summer of 1976. Carter got out of jail for a couple of months and he started touring around the United States trying to get money. So he was just trying to make money and trying to get money for a legal defense to kind of prove it. I didn't say if artists got out of jail. I was trying to find that myself, but it, I actually don't think artists got out of jail during this period. I think it was just Carter. Yeah, I think a lot of the a lot of the kind of writing on this subject here is basically about Carter getting out of jail and the actually the bail bondswoman who helped him, but it doesn't really state anything about Artis or where he was. So I assume it's safe to assume that he's probably in jail. Yeah, the the bail bondswoman that helped him was a woman called Caroline Keeley, and Keeley helped Carter to raise funds. But uh, when they were raising uh, funds. They got into a bit of a dispute over a hotel bill, and uh, Carter punched her. Right. Um, he essentially beat her up over yeah. this disputed hotel bill. Um, mm. Probably not the best move for Carter at this time, trying to clear your name and kind of look a little friendly, and maybe not the one who murdered a bunch of people going around beating people up. It's really not going to kind of help your cause there. Well, I mean, I'm going to just add in allegedly, in quotes, <laughs> because, uh, yeah... He allegedly beat her up that she uh, started she sued him but uh, her trial didn't let she go anywhere so there was never legal proof that he did it but honestly I would say of Carter he probably did yeah sure I think yeah allegedly this the reason why it's here is probably because Carter's tried so hard to kind of defend himself in this case and it's made its way into you know print and everything like that so yeah. it probably happened Although Kelly goes on and it does stick up for him later on in court and stuff like that. But I think it definitely happened, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, and uh, pretty much it was reported by the Philadelphia Daily News initially, and then it spread into different publications. So a lot of the celebrity and public support for Carter started to disappear. I mean, Dylan was still friendly with Carter up to his release from prison. So, like, Dylan was still supporting, but a lot of the people who had... Uh, done who had been supporting uh, just kind of faded away yeah exactly and so also at this time carter's wife divorce begins divorce proceedings against carter um just kind of basically saying that he'd been unfaithful to her after his prison um release so i don't know maybe some kind of like love triangle with uh, carter's wife and um carolyn kelly i don't know yeah well you know uh, this is just, you know, things aren't looking well for Carter's public image at the time. So he had had a big swell of public popularity in 1974, but just before the trial, it kind of has backfired a little bit on him. 
Right, and so this is like the, the setting of the stage for the new trial to begin. This is the backdrop. The trial begins, or opens up on this, you know, negative press for Carter. So the trial begins, and the defense immediately start questioning the witness testimony from the previous trials, and they started questioning Bellow's character, which they had done, which they couldn't have done in the first trial. Strangely enough, Bradley, the man who helped get him convicted, Bellow's friend, he wasn't invited by the prosecution or by the defense, so he just seems to drop away from the story. Kind of like in the same way he appeared in the story, he's kind of just left out. Oh, by the way, there's this guy, he was with me robbing it, and now he's gone. Do you think it was just like he drew something on his hand, and it was like, Hi, I'm Bradley! Because Bradley's, Bradley's <laughs> name, let's actually look at Bradley's name. Do you think, I never saw a picture of Bradley, I only saw pictures of Bellow. Do you think that there's a chance that Bradley is a fictional character? Uh, I don't know. Or maybe he just has some incompetence to him as well. It's possible, right? Like maybe he's just not kind of a lame person, you know? <laughs> I think, that's why he was dropped off. I think Bellow and Bradley are both very lame people. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But maybe Bradley the worst of the two, I'm not sure. But yeah, definitely for sure. Needless to say. So this trial, the defense also started questioning an investigator called Fred Hogan. And they questioned, he bribed or coerced Bellow or Bradley, which he denied. So they were claiming that Vincent uh, de Simone had done something bad. They're also saying Hogan did something bad. So they're saying, look, the police are going after this man. Right, exactly. Um, so on the witness stand after this happens, Bellow kind of states that he changed his story in 1974 uh, because associates of Carter offered him $20,000 uh, to, to do so. And uh, prosecution asked judge not to let Bellow's 1974 testimony be known by the jury as it would hurt their case. I don't um, think that that's how uh, trials <laughs> should really work. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty ridiculous. So we got, you know, both sides here, it seems like, are um, maybe trying to bribe the other person. This seems a little tenuous, though, here, having Carter side trying to offer him. Basically, the Patterson, New Jersey police... Are trying to stuff the pockets of Bellow to keep him in their pocket. I think Bellow is the person out of this case who just seems to be getting thousands and thousands of dollars being offered to him. <laughs> I think this is the best thing that ever happened to Bellow, really. It's possible, you know. And you know what's really funny? It's possible that maybe Bellow was the watchman for for a real murderer, and he was actually in cahoots with the real murderers. That would actually be a really good theory. It makes more sense. You know, he was right around there. He was able to, like, cast misdirection in the eyes of black, you know, in, in towards black people. Uh, I mean, who else? Like, that would be a very smart way to set up a murder. Oh, actually, I'd never thought of it that way, but that's a pretty bomb theory. What happened was uh, the defense gave their side, and the prosecution tried to get uh, Carolyn Keeley, that you said earlier, they tried to get her to give incriminating evidence against Carter. There was a person, a police investigator called Charge Rika, who said, don't you want to get even with Carter? Don't you want to sure, just say that he told you that he did the murder and we could use it in trial and Carter will go to jail. But Keeley, even though Carter had her, still believed in Carter. Right. So there's this um, kind of backbone of integrity with her, which is kind of a shining light in this story. You know, she gets hit by by Carter. Um, she's suing Carter for $1.1 million uh, and still, um, you know, tells them that the investigator came to her and asked them to do this. So, you know, it's, it's yeah, exactly. This happened in 1976. So the civil rights movement had gone into full swing by this point. You know, it's 10 years after the 60s. And it wasn't actually an all white jury in this case. There was, it was mostly white, but there were some black members of the jury. So it looked pretty like Carter's case could win. Right, so exactly. Here we have the jury deliberating for nine hours, but the same uh, verdict comes out, finding both men guilty once more. Yeah, that they were pretty much, no, no, you're the right people to do this. And, uh... Exactly. So, but this is pretty wild to me. Um, I couldn't find basically where the jury was able to make up their mind that they had done it. All the evidence that presented in this case 
seem to point towards the innocence of the two men. So I really don't know what happened with that jury. Yeah, I mean, again, I don't. I mean, I don't think 1976. Even though we were talking a bit about civil rights, I don't. I still kind of think that, you know, if you're a black man in court, uh, you might not get the most fair trial. Yeah, that's true. Um, for sure, though, I think probably jury has to be reached by a unanimous decision and you have like a few black people on there um you know i i don't know it just seems it seems pretty hard like i guess maybe they were just like threw up their hands like you know what whatever let's get out of here i've got i've got stuff to do yes he's guilty i i don't know okay cool so both men went back to prison Artis ended up uh, being paroled in 1981 i don't know how you can get paroled from a life sentence but he did well, Let's okay. So let's back up just a second here because I think the verdict was different in this second court case. Artis, I think, received uh, a one life sentence at this time, and then um, J- uh, Carter received two instead of three. Okay, so that's that's the reason why actually I hadn't read that, but because of this, Artis was released uh, in 1981 on parole. Right. So he's he's out. Yeah. So he was only in jail for 15 years and. He's still actually a relatively young man. He's only 33 at the time, so it's badly damaged his life, but, you know, he still stands a chance. Sure, exactly. And actually, I didn't do any follow-up research on artists and where he went after this, but that would be interesting to find out. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, I, he also went up to Canada, I believe. Oh, did he? Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's but, right, because actually, I, I did read that he was taking care of um, Carter in his older age. Yes, yeah. So I think that both of them were just like, let's get out of America, but <laughs> we'll, move, we'll move on to that slightly later. Artis gets out in 1981, but Carter just keeps trying to get his conviction overturned, and he goes to the New Jersey Supreme Court on the ground that Bellow's testimony was unconstitutional. He's asking habeas corpus, which means where is the body? You know, well, where is this? Let me out. But yeah. yeah, again, the Supreme Court says... For free decision, no, you did it. Stay in jail. Exactly. Very unfortunate for him in this case. But you know, after that, they file another one. They file another one for not the um, New Jersey Supreme Court, but now in um, federal district court. Yeah, I mean, this seems like the smarter move because <laughs> I think they started to realize you can't get a fair trial in New Jersey. They moved off and they went through different courts. It was the United States District Court for new jersey right so it's um yeah so it's it's a federal court doesn't belong to the state of new jersey but oversees new jersey and probably i would imagine because i think this may be different there may have been some different organization at the time period but the district courts now oversee certain parts of different states and are kind of not gerrymandered but just have like more amorphous kind of um zoning to them okay So this is what he figured he'd get a fair trial, and uh, he did. He, well, depends if you think he was guilty or not, but uh, yeah, because they put in this writ of habeas corpus, they said, like, no, we actually can't find evidence. And at the age of 48, Carter was freed from prison on, uh, he was just completely freed, and he could do whatever he wanted. He was out without bail. Right, so exactly. So the district court here grants the writ of habeas corpus, noting the prosecution had been, quote, um, predicated upon appeal to racism rather than to reason and concealment rather than disclosure. So essentially what the district court here is saying, kind of what we've been talking about a bit here, um, this court was founded on racism. It didn't really look at the facts. It was trying to conceal, um, you know, wrongful wrongful, uh, testimony and eyewitness accounts and rather than being open and free with the facts. Okay, but uh, the thing is that, uh, yeah, so this went through, and the prosecutors tried to bring it to the Supreme Court, but they declined to hear it, so they had two options. They could try Carter and Artis one more time, or just leave it, and they decided with 22-year-old evidence, and it's 1985, yeah, let's just leave it. Right, so exactly. I think, I think yeah. The, I guess like the reasoning they said was trying a 22-year-old 22 case after it happened would be uh, unsustainable, um, is what I think what they said, which is, I mean, political for what? Um, which is not popular? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but the thing I find very odd is 
they actually didn't say that he was innocent. He got out, but it was like, no apology, no nothing. You're out, but you're out on a kind of technicality that they never <laughs> they never really announced, like, you know, no, you didn't do this crime, you didn't do this. It was just like, oh, no, there's a writ of habeas corpus, so you're out. But it wasn't like he could claim money from the state of New Jersey for false imprisonment or anything like that. Right, right. Um, I did you even did you did you check to see if he tried to uh, sue them at all? Uh, I had not seen that. I think that he just booked it to Canada straight out of getting out of prison. Right. I mean, he spent the his, most of his adult life uh, in a prison cell or in a courtroom, so it makes sense. Get the heck out of there. Yeah, he kind of realized, and um, there had been a group of Canadians who had been helping him throughout the trial. So they were like, uh, I forget the name of the group, but they were based in like freedom and civil rights and liberty so they went they were, down yeah they were actually called um canadians for the hurricane oh was that what the name was That's no no cool. i just no i just made that up okay you shouldn't have just said that well, because people won't check <laughs> <laughs> okay so he ended up becoming the director of the association for the defense of the wrongly convicted he was a motivational speaker and during a conference in western australia he announced that he had prostate cancer in March 2012. Artists went, moved in with him and started caring with him, started caring for him, but uh, pretty much within two months he was dead. Two years. Oh, sorry, I misread that. Yes, within two years he was dead. I thought that was, uh, it's 2012-2014. Yes, he died April 20th, 2014. So, yeah. Right, so he was given two to six months to live and... Uh, that was in March of 12, and then in April of 14, he died. So still had a lot of that fighting spirit in him. Yeah, he died, uh, just checking the age. He had a very, he had a reasonably long life after 70. he left prison. He lived to 70 what? I think it's, he lived until 77. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, if you consider that he got out of prison at the age of 48, he did have a good 30 years, so uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. So let's discuss this now and say, did he do it? Do you think that uh, Reuben Carter murdered the people in the Lafayette Grill? Well, before coming to this, I was skeptical kind of to decide either way. Um, one of the, the strongest pieces of evidence to me was that Patty Valentine was able, Patty Valentine member being the, the woman who lived above the murder scene, testified and stated that she saw Reuben Carter's out-of-state plates and was basically able to describe the background and the, the lettering of it. Not the numbers or the tag itself, but just basically that it was blue background with gold lettering. That's pretty strong for me. It definitely doesn't say that he was the one who did it. I mean, you know, stranger things have happened, I'm sure. There could have been, you know, another similar car with those plates but at the same time it's just kind of i don't know that smells a little bit but i mean that's basically that's my only qualm uh, you know against uh carter's innocence the the essentially you know the the case against him is filled with inaccuracies filled with you know racist kind of um statements and everything like this and it just seems yeah it just seems like the fingers were clearly pointed at carter from the get-go unduly yes okay i get that the this thing i find odd about it is that they found the shotgun in the trunk of the car but you know the way that the evidence goes with the car that if you were running away from a crime scene and you hopped into a car i don't think they would have really had time to put the gun into the trunk yeah, maybe not, but also I'm not sure of these makes and the models of these cars, but there's often there's often a connection between the backseat of a car and the trunk. Oh, okay, that might make more sense. Uh, I don't know much about uh, Dodge Monaco's or uh, I yeah uh, I don't I don't know either if that's the case or not. But that no, but that the the point you bring up is 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 a good point. Yeah, if you're running away, um, you're not going to really have time to stop and pop the trunk and throw your your 12 gauge at the back there. Yeah, I mean, getting all saying my own opinion, I don't think he was guilty. I mean, I'm basing this that I really there's part of Carter's character that if you watch the movie Hurricane, you kind of think he's like a very genial, nice guy, 
I don't think he was probably the nicest fellow, but I think he had a life experience that he was struggling. So, uh, you know, he, I can, I could kind of see Carter almost doing the crime, but I just couldn't see artists do the crime. You know, he just doesn't seem the type. Yeah, exactly. And in the, in the trial, their, their lawyer, um, basically kind of set up a character defense for artists and was basically like, Hey, this is like an upstanding uh, member of society. You know, he's going to school in Colorado and, you know, he's never been involved with any crimes before. Why the heck would he, where's the impetus for him to go and shoot these, these people in this nightclub, you know, or this, uh, yeah. this bar and grill? Like why, why there's no reason. And I think, yeah, that's completely correct. Like what the heck he just, off the whim decides he's going to go and shoot these people doesn't make much sense to me you know there was the murder of the black man earlier that evening but it kind of makes little enough sense that they were like okay a white person shot a black man therefore we're going to do retaliation against random white people like i would have felt that if they had tar if the murder had happened for the man who had uh, murdered carter's friend that would have made a lot more sense than be like, okay, let's just shoot up the Lafayette Grill. Yeah, it's it seems random and not connected at all. Sure, exactly. Yeah. It's just random, like, oh, let's go find some white people and kill them. Like, yeah, I don't. That doesn't make much sense either. I mean, I definitely agree with you. Like, it definitely fits Reuben Carter's character that maybe he could have committed the crimes for sure, just given his history of violence and problems in the past. Uh, you know, stabbing some man at the age of eleven. In the movie, they actually kind of portray it as, I think, the man was trying to, like, take advantage of him sexually. Uh, I think, if I remember correctly from the movie, or something like that. Uh, very kind of strange, but, I mean, who knows about that. Regardless, he stabbed a man in 11. Maybe it was in self-defense, but, uh, you know, that's not the one instance of his of, uh, violence in his, in his age and career and everything like that in his life. So I could definitely... Character-wise, I could definitely see Reuben Carter committing these crimes. Uh, Evidence-wise, it doesn't it doesn't point to him doing it. I've got that just come up with a theory, and this is a dumb theory, but I'll just pitch it to you. Maybe if Carter did it, maybe it wasn't that she artists. It was the third man in the car who got dropped oh, off oh, earlier. Right. Because that, no, please go ahead. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I was just gonna say that makes. I mean that that's a good that's a good theory. I don't think it's dumb at all. I think you know, kind of. Yeah, I, I I'm, not, I'm not even sure if the police followed up with that man. You know, his name just wasn't in any reports because I was trying to find him and be like, who was this third man? But you know, his name seems pretty anonymous from him. Exactly, and I was trying to find that too. I couldn't find anything as well. That's pretty. Yeah, that's that smells a little bit. Perhaps it was Bellows. <laughs> <laughs> That's why the case fell apart. But yeah, I think my main conclusion is Bello was a scumbag who made at least 30 grand off this case. <laughs> yeah, at least 30 grand, probably a little bit more. But um, for sure, Bello obviously lying here, going back and forth between, you know, whoever is going to give him the most money, bringing his uh, friend in just for a little bit more um you know, structural support to his arguments and everything like that. Yeah, it's pretty ridiculous. I mean, also, it just seems pretty absurd that a jury is going to trust the eyewitness account of someone who admittedly was robbing someone in the middle of the night. You know, I, it's just, it just smells so much. Okay, well, it's probably best that we wrap up now. Uh, Van, is there anything that you would like to plug? Oh, yeah, um... So I do a little bit of photography, and I'm kind of actually starting a photography business here soon. Um, so you guys feel free to come check out my Instagram at vannotvan, which is my handle. So V-A-N-N-N-O-T-V-A-N. And uh, yeah, Luke, thanks for having me. And as for me, I would like to plug the following podcasts. Uh, I'd like to plug Disaster Artists, which is a great apocalyptic podcast, which is run by Johnny and Shane. Very funny podcast. I'd also like to plug uh, Not Another Fake Newscast with Jerry and Paul, also a very great podcast. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I, we're going to, we've recorded another episode and it will be released later this week. Uh, we're keeping that a secret. But uh, yeah, guys, uh, thanks very much for tuning in. And uh, 
yeah thanks for van being the guest okay i'll talk to you guys later bye bye